Time to get to our penultimate, I love those SAT words, penultimate session. Uh, early in the day, as the previous speaker who couldn't pronounce my name right said, uh, Jim Spath uh, moderated a panel, a discussion I should say, okay, which focused on traditional measures such as currency, impressions, uh, and the foundations for measuring digital place-based media. Cool, okay. This time around, we're gonna talk about if we will, building upon those with a different, slightly different approach and angle. We're gonna, the three panelists are gonna talk a bit about engagement, emotional attachment, and other such metrics. And first, um, let me tell you what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna come up here. I'm gonna give, uh, a speaker's gonna come up. He's gonna, he's gonna talk a little bit about what he does so there's some context to it. Then there'll be a presentation, and let's be honest. These are not huge companies. These are growing, wonderful, growing organizations. So their presentation will be a bit of a commercial, let's face it. But we are here in the advertising business, so that's a good thing, right? Cool. Don't put on the valuations. It was too much of a commercial. Thank you very much. Then we're going to do it again and again, and then we're going to have some Q&A, OK? So who wants, who wants to? Mike, you want to go first? Do we practice this really well? Yeah, Would you? Yeah, we All right. Well. Please um, welcome to the stage, Mike Bloxham. Come on over. <laughs> Do you want to get back? Where's our slide? Where's our order? Yeah. Well, yeah. Where's our order? Where's the? Where's where's the ah, that looks like a remote control. Let's yeah, see. You can tell maybe we you indeed practice Maybe you don't go. Well. Maybe you don't go first. Let's I don't see know. who goes first. Let's see. Yeah, that's a very good point. Let me introduce the first speaker, which may or may not be me. It's you. It is Fantastic. me. Well, what do you know? Okay, we're ahead. Um, hopefully this is not going to be a commercial. It's not intended to be. It's meant to be a quick run through, more of an explication, if you will, um, of what USA Touchpoints uh, is all about. It was actually mentioned this morning by Laura McDaniel um, from the Walmart Smart Network Martin Agency, incredibly long title. Um, organization um, in the panel that was run. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a little about it so that we can set up the conversation uh, after the other guys have talked about their current offering uh, as it's emerging to the industry. Um, one thing I'll say before that, I love the title of this conference, Context Matters. Um, when we set up Media Behavior Institute, which is behind USA Touchpoints, all the way back in 2008, um, we've been operating in stealth mode for quite a while until earlier this year, really. Um, it was entirely based on the premise that, that context is not only matters, it's actually fundamental to all forms of communication and the effectiveness thereof. Um, because it actually influences receptivity massively. If you fully understand the drivers of receptivity, then clearly um, you can optimize return on investment. However that is defined, and it's obviously different for different people. For media owners, it's frankly selling as much of your inventory as possible for the highest price possible. For media um, buyers, it's about getting a good deal and getting a maximum return for your advertisers. Um, so it depends where you're coming from. Anyway, what's our mission? Basically, it's, it's the bit in blue, forget the rest. Create value for advertisers, for agencies, for media through greatly enhanced advertising ROI. Basically, by enabling people to deliver messages to consumers where they are most receptive. Um, and that is all about context. Let's talk about what context is. There we go. Life context. A lot of times when we talk about context, we're talking about media context. In what media environment is my ad appearing? That's one aspect of context, no, no question. Turner have done remarkably well um, out of uh, delivering uh, advertising propositions in the context of programming. They've, done, they've shown remarkable uplifts in some cases uh, in terms of sales metrics. But what we're talking about here is context as defined by the consumer's life. And it's a number of different core metrics. There are elements within this, but basically it's about, yes, it's about media. Which media are people used and which, we, uh, which media are people exposed to? But it's who are they with? Um, where are they? Place. Um, what are they actually doing wherever they are and whoever they're with? How are they feeling emotionally? What mood states do, uh, are they occupying? Um, what do they buy? What do they own? What do they use? Heavy, medium, and light users. When are they doing whatever it is they're doing? And 
So and that obviously varies throughout the day. But and what kind of people are they? These are all the key variables that make up the life context in which people receive our messages. And of course, you know, I, I've said over the years there's no such thing as a siloed consumer. One of the challenges we've always had to address in media research is that media research has historically been siloed. As a result, it can never do a full job. It's too difficult to try and meld the, the different uh, data sets that we get, which are, aren't designed to, to haven't been historically designed to be matched together. We're making a lot more progress with fusion these days. This is what we're trying to do here. Pull it all together, same sample, same place, same time. So this is basically what we do, a really dumbed down version of the methodology. We draw our sample from GFK MRI's uh, survey of the American consumer. Uh, it's a 21,000 database. Um, people about whom we know absolutely everything in terms of product purchase, product use, where they sit within the household and so on. We ask people to uh, maintain a diary, an electronic diary on a smartphone device, which they complete every half an hour or at least in half hour increments. Some people do it religiously every half an hour, some people do it every 40 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever it may be. After 90 minutes we send them a little text to remind them and they fill it in. Maybe an hour later after that we tell them that it's going to explode in their hand. Um, but what they do essentially is they tell us where they are or where they have been during that previous half an hour, whom they've been with, what activities they've been doing, which media they've been using, and we use a series of emoticons to actually find out what emotions they've been experiencing during that period. And we drill into each of those. So if we say they've been watching television, what channel have you been watching? What genre of programming? Uh, if you've been traveling, what mode of transport have you been using? If you've been shopping, is it grocery shopping? Have you been out of the mall or where is it? So we drill in. So we're looking at all of these in terms of locations. There's uh, just some of them, we're looking at workplace and a shopping mall. I have to say that because I'm English, I can't say mall without it sounding like a line is ripping somebody apart on the Serengeti. A grocery store, the airport, QSR, medical facility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're tracking in total 14 locations, nine social settings. I'm alone, I'm with friends, I'm, I'm with my spouse, I'm with my children, etc. cetera. Uh, 19 life activities. At the moment, 54 broadcast and cable networks, which frankly is too many. Um, and 11 program genre, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at 13 emotional states. And the agencies, the media planning agencies, are finding that particularly interesting because they can match the emotional tonality of a campaign against where they're going to find people. So they can look at these data sets which they can access through the likes of IMS and Telmar and Point Logic and very soon memory. Um, and they can say, I'm targeting mums aged between X and Y and I want to find them when they're feeling empowered and, and upbeat and happy. When is that? And we can show them through the data, or they can find out through the data on their desktop, when, they are, when that is the emotional prime time for those emotional states. Then they can say, well, where are they? And they can say, what are they doing? And who are they with? And which media come into play before, during, and after those periods? So whatever the location is, you can start from there. You can say, OK, it's a shopping mall, or it's a QSR, or it's a medical facility. Which media are used while they're there and in the period before? We've done some analysis on previous data sets where we say, okay, people go into the grocery store. Which media dominate in the hour before they go to the grocery store? And what are they exposed to while they're there? Um, where are they before they go to the grocery store? What's the mode of transport they use to get there? What are they doing? Who are they with? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that can be back analyzed against the data from the MRI data that we have, which, looking at, which is looking at what products and services they use uh, and all the rest of it. So in summary, um, what we believe we've got here is a uniquely comprehensive range of insights into the full consumer context as defined by the way they lead their lives at different parts of the day, different days of the week and so on, um, in which place-based media are encountered. It's not only place-based, which is really important because that way this can be leveraged to help planners ultimately understand where they can justify allocating money out of the, the overall media budget to place-based propositions. Um, and it's being used at the moment uh, in its fledgling stages to look at sales development, where it's developing pitches for advertisers, where it's developing new media inventory, uh, media planning by the agencies, content development and distribution strategies, at very early stages for that, but I see great potential for it. Certainly cross-media, uh, cross-platform media allocation um, and to some extent, budget discussions as well. People are actually saying we're using this to understand 
what we can and can't afford to cut from our budget. And then there's the broader mix when we're talking to advertisers about integrated marketing planning away from just media to the broader marketing mix. And that is my time and that is bang on. I'm so pleased. Look at that. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Welcome, Jeff Griffin, please. Thank you very much. Can we use this mic up? Good. So in full disclosure to, and in complete opposition to what Dave said earlier, for half the room that knows me, I'm Jeff Griffin. I can't not sell something. This is a commercial. So strap in and get comfortable. Um, so Shopper Sciences, for those of you that have not heard of us, we're about a year and a half old company. It was formed uh, by myself. Uh, my background is CPG and also the digital place-based media industry. And then my partner, John Ross, was the uh, CMO of the Home Depot, which you might have heard of. And the two of us want to do this. This is what we ultimately want to do, and that is to understand shoppers and shopping behavior better than any other company in the world. Ultimately, when you have a question that you just say, gosh, I wish I knew what shoppers were doing in this category, you'll pick up the phone and call us. That's literally where we want to go. And that grew from a mutual frustration on the opposite side of a table. John is a retailer, me as a supplier, and the problem that we always had was is I'm pitching my networks or I'm pitching my brands and he's over there trying to, you know, to gain share from his competitors. Neither of us knew what it was that influenced a shopper to go from undecided to decided in any particular category. And it's different for all of us. And there are many things that influence us. And I think through uh, years of you know, just getting to know each other, we figured out that there was no such thing. So we're trying to find it. We're not there yet, but we're trying to, to find what it is that drives people from undecided to decided. This year, we've worked with a pretty neat group of folks. Um, you would think that when you say shopper sciences or you hear uh, you know, an old retail guy and, a, and a, an ex-supplier uh, getting together, we were going to be serving retailers. Retailers are, to a certain extent, our customers. What has surprised us is the absolute heterogeneity of that group. You see Google, um, obviously a, a complete network operator, sitting right next to Coke, the, the ultimate branded uh, uh, advertiser. And then you see some other folks in there. And what they all have in common was the exact same problem that we just talked about. What in the world drives someone from undecided to decided in fill in the blank category? Okay. Now, in the spirit of giving to get, I'd like to share a couple of things with you first that we've learned this year before I show you some of the, the cool things that we're doing. First of all, these are, um, and, and I say this for retail, because when we talk about digital play space, that can mean anywhere, and retail to us means everything. Anywhere that you can shop and buy, online, offline, we don't care. But because of this particular audience's where we live in someone else's home, basically a retail environment, we thought you might be interested in knowing what retailers are asking us as we sit down and talk to them. And this actually comes through a lot of uh, discussions that we've had this year. And the number one question we get is, what can we do to influence shopper traffic and conversion? Now, there's a reason we put influence in big typeface. That word comes up over and over and over again. It's influence. They don't say capture. They don't say, you know, use some of these words that the trade type words we're used to. They are saying, what can we do to influence shopper traffic and conversion? Right behind that, of course, how can they grow that share without giving away gross margin through discounting? They are retailers after all. Their life is not easy. They operate on the thinnest margins in the business world. So how in the world can they do that? Third, and for those of us that have branded or that are branded suppliers or that, for instance, our clients are branded suppliers, this is a toughie, but this is the third most uh, often uh, received question that we got this year. How can a retailer grow profitability through proprietary brands without hurting the draw rate? Because they know they come for a brand, shopper will come for a brand, but if they can sell them private label, it's a much better margin play for the retailer. How do you do that? Right below it, and this is incredibly important to this audience, and this is actually in the, in the order we've received it, how and when do we divert from traditional media, in their case print, tends to be the biggest source of, of spending for most retailers, to emerging media. And we've seen that in some cases. Obviously some of the networks in here, some of your advertisers are your retailers, but that's really important to them. And then finally, how can they drive shopper loyalty among their best shoppers and still drive incremental traffic? Guess what? Their fifth question was their first. Shop, it, literally, driving shopper traffic and conversion is what a retailer cares about. You help them solve that problem, you got a friend for life. Okay? Now, um, I love the fact that this actually, we have a big room now. This is really easy to see when you're up close to it. In the back, you won't have to do what I tell the folks up front to do, which is squint. Um, what I want you to do, the reason I want you to squint is that the detail isn't important. What is important are the spikes that you see. And here we took two studies that we've done this year. We were the primary research provider for Google's Zero Moment of Truth initiative, 
We're also the primary uh, insights provider for the GMA, the Grocery Manufacturers Association Shopper 5.0 study. We took all of the endemic products sold at retail and ba basically made a little macro study out of it. And there's tens of thousands of, of people that we've talked to here. And what we wanted to look at was what influenced shoppers in all of those, in average, it's not one particular category, it's lots of them, to go from undecided to decided. What influenced them as they were shopping? And again, it's from the moment you said you wanted to buy something till the moment you bought. And that's a real big point of clarification, by the way, of, of our methodology versus others. Uh, we don't trust shoppers. We love them. We don't trust them. So our methodology means you cannot talk to me unless you have just bought something that I'm interested in. Otherwise, thanks for, but move on. So when we talk to those people, the spikes that you see, and this is not in time order, it really isn't, but it looks like a path to purchase model you might see. Search is way over on the left and goes all the way to event marketing on the right. The average usage, meaning on average, uh, each one of those individual influence nodes, every bar was an influencer of some type, you know, talking to friends and family, Googling something, whatever, was used about, by about 9% of the population. But what really starts to get interesting is when you see what the top five were. Okay, you see deal hunting is the first use of search. It's not organic search, it's deal hunting search. Okay? Friends and family is that big spike in the middle. We never ever see friends and family come in less than third place as an influencer. Now, you can call it word of mouth marketing, you can call it whatever you want, but if you haven't worked through some way to integrate friends and family influence into the business that you're in, you really have to start doing that. And not, un, not surprising to us, uh, very surprising to a number of folks, is that three of the top five influencers for products sold at retail actually happen in the store. That's the real key learning here is what happens there. And just to, to give you the, the finer point on this, product display, it's shocking how important seeing something is to people. Uh, display, when we say display packaging, what we really mean there is the package itself. Uh, the package itself as a medium is as influential as anything we have ever studied. Um, and in fact, in some categories, it is the most influential uh, influence node. And then finally, signage and POP, that would be literally part of what you're, where you come into play. So those are just a view, those, those are two outputs of, uh, or one output really, of some of the things that we do. Primarily our core business is influencers and barriers. That's what you see, we put out really neat uh, heat maps, that kind of thing. Let's get to the fun stuff that, that may be more interesting to some folks here. And the first is emotional influence. This is our sort of leading edge work. Um, our bread and butter is just that the stuff we just talked about, the influence. But as we all know, the impact of, in, of emotion on shopping itself is incredibly important. So we were asked by a cosmetics manufacturer to understand it. And what's the difference between a cosmetic shopper who is, is a, basically a frequent shopper and one who is infrequent? So what we do is we don't put a colander on anybody's head or you know, strap them up with any kind of electrodes or anything. We put a little thing on their uh, wrist and put a little wristband on and they, we let them go shopping and then we ethn ethnographically just follow them on that shopping event and we do that with obviously dozens and dozens of people. Here they were shopping for foundation, lip color, mascara and nail polish. They were wearing this little thing called a Q sensor. Um, it measures your body temperature, your motion and this is galvanic skin response, a lovely way of stating uh, how much you sweat because that is the key emotional indicator of how your underlying, uh, uh, your hypothalamus is actually reacting. Um, and we went shopping with them. And so here's what we got, okay? This is a frequent cosmetic shopper and she's entering the store on the left, this is time-based. Left is uh, entering the store and then checking out on the right. And where you see the graph sort of get a little bit spikier and a little choppier, that's emotional stressing. It's not that she's you know, freaking out or anything, she may be having a fabulous time, but based on what her body is saying, there is stress in play. And you see the two gray areas, there's trying to match the colors to skin tone. It's been a while since I've shopped for cosmetics, but apparently that's a big deal. <laughs> So, you, and it seems to be stressful even for people who do it all the time. Um, imagine if you don't do it much. The poor thing looks like she's having a heart attack, okay? It's the exact same thing. And look at the stressors that she's going through on this. And the reason this cosmetics manufacturer, which is enormous and has a pile of money to throw at this problem, wanted to know it was they thought they had the problem solved. And they didn't see a dent with the tactics they were applying to it because they hadn't studied the emotions first. And emotions, especially when it comes to cosmetics, can you imagine a more emotional category than cosmetics? So they, they, and by doing this, of course, it allowed them to take another look at the tactics they're using and to go that way. And there she is. And we got her, we, we called the ambulance later. She was fine. Um, All right, and the last one here is, the, uh, and, and we have a lot of folks in this audience who are, um, there are some friendly competitors in here. There are also a lot of our customers in this room. One of the things that we have been asked over this last year is with the amount of people that we talk to and having them just bought in a category, 
how can that learning be brought to bear for the benefit of a network provider, for a brand, for an agency? You know, you, how can you make sense of the clutter, so to speak? So the best analogy that we could come up with is, I don't know if anybody's as old as me, but I remember 1984 when, it, when all you did in front of your new 35 cable channel uh, uh, TV was actually just click up on the remote because you're like, this is awesome. I can just see what else is on. And you could do that. It's like that right now, except shoppers, the problem is they don't have a remote. They do have a smartphone, they're broadcasting, but they don't have the ability to flip through these channels. It really is like network to cable all over again. Now imagine you're an advertiser, and a lot of, a lot of us in here are. How in the world do we decide which of those things matter to a shopper? Which ones of them influence them to go from undecided to decided? That's part of what we study, but what really comes from it is the clarity that each individual brand, which and they are all unique in their own way, in their own categories, how they bring that to bear. So for instance, this is uh, a way we tend to take the shopper learning that we get and turn it into something reasonably actionable. The three dimensions that you see on that cube are improved connectivity between the brand and shopper, making the shopper smarter and faster, and improving measurement of shopper marketing effectiveness. We didn't make that up, the advertiser did. The uh, advertiser gave us those three KPIs and said, okay, of these 150 different providers that, that Shopper Science has identified, what, which ones do we return the call? We get these calls all day long. Which ones should we use? Well, if these three things matter and we take our shoppers and they tell us what influenced them, this is what you get. Out of the constellation of challenges and opportunities that you could have, these are the people that we told the supplier to call because based on what they wanted to do, that's how, it, how uh, it, it scored out. And there, there was no agnostic to that, by the way. We really are Switzerland when it comes to, to who comes out in this. We let the shopper decide. But the scales are ease of implementation at scale on the bottom, and it's from low to high, and then a match to that brand's DSM goals uh, on, from low to high. So again, they can't call everybody. You can't call all of them. But if you have, find some structure and you let the shopper lead and you honor what matters to her, then you'll find a way through it. Okay. Can you put it there you go. Thank you. We'll, uh, please welcome Gary Reisman yeah. from New Media Metrics. Thank you. Just press this phone. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking today, I'm going to be talking about uh, context and emotional attachment. I know we are talking about emotional attachment in many different ways. Uh, what um, I want to impress upon you is that emotional attachment is actually, we've talked today a lot about a lot of different metrics and impressions. What, um, what emotional attachment is, it's, it's the most um, practical and impactful relevancy metric, in, and it cuts across all different uh, brand categories and all different media. Um, what New Media Metrics does is we employ a proprietary patent protected approach to quantitatively measure emotional attachment, and we measure emotional attachments to brands and to media properties. And we have empirically proven over many different years uh, that emotional attachment as we measure it is highly predictive of what people do, what they buy, and the media that they view. Um, so why is that? Well, the main reason is that the foundation of what we do is rooted in real academic theory, which is based on real human truths. Um, and you know, there, there's many questions in today's marketplace. I mean, most, many, many people ask the question, uh, which is in a um, highly fragmented media marketplace with tremendous product proliferation, how does the marketer survive? But the real question that should be asked is, how does the consumer survive? How do they determine what or pull to them the products and the media that are most relevant to them. It's a very confusing world. Um, well, it all really, uh, you, can, you can answer that question by reaching back to 1937, which is way before this complex world uh, existed. Uh, our research is based off of work created in 1937 by Jonathan Bowlby. He was a child development psychologist. Uh, he developed a way to measure quantitatively attachments between mother and child. Um, and uh, in, uh, brilliantly, he also developed a elegant 11-point scale to actually measure emotional attachment. What we have done is we have patent-protected uh, an approach that adapts 
Jonathan Bowlby's work for media and marketing purposes. Uh, we measure emotional attachment to brands and media properties and a whole host of other things across this 11 point scale. And what we have found is if you are highly attached to a brand, nine and 10 to a brand, you buy that product more frequently, you go deeper into the product line, and you will spend more on that product. Think about your own behaviors. Think about a brand that you are completely unwilling to give up and your behavior for that brand. You represent the 80-20 rule for the marketer, the 20% of people that provide 80% of their revenues. That's what this is measuring. At the same time, if you are highly attached to a media property, you actually pull the media property to you and you view it intently. Again, think about your behavior on any given night and the media that you pull to you. So what we do as a new media metrics is we align the brands, people who are attached to brand with the media that they're highly attached to. Or said another way, people who are receptive to your brand message in media that they are fully engaged in. We call it actually buying the buyers. Uh, why go after the 80% of people who are less likely to buy your product? Let's find the people who are actually going to buy. And when you do that, when you target people who are highly attached to a brand, they're two and a half times more likely to pay attention to your ad because it's relevant information. It is not superfluous advertising. At the same time, if they're attached to a media property, they're 40% more likely to pay attention to that media property, and the pay dirt comes when you put that together. So when you target someone who's attached to a brand and a media property they're highly attached to, the relevancy goes up and they're three times as likely to buy or use your product. And the lucky strike extra with emotional attachment is that these people who are nine and 10 or highly attached to your brand are your super influencers. They're 43% likely to use word of mouth either through social channels, uh, either talking to their friends or through Facebook or whatever it is, uh, texting to uh, talk about new products and services. Uh, we work with lots of clients on a custom basis, but we've also created syndicated uh, uh, product. And uh, we measure emotional attachment in the syndicated uh, product to 330 brands across 30 different categories. And we link those high value buyers to the cross-platform media that they are most attached to or most intently consume. TV, print, web, and digitally placed, uh, based out of home and social media. These are some of the environments that we uh, measure emotional attachment in the digitally placed based area. Um, and uh, we uh, have one example uh, to show you in those categories, and that is in the health cub. So what we're going to be looking at is uh, people who are highly attached to receiving information in the form of advertising in a health club. Uh, and uh, what we know is we have 330 brands. I'm just showing you some of the data. All of our data, by the way, is expressed in percentages and in indices. And what we are actually quantifying is the saturation of high value buyers who are intently viewing each of these media properties. It's where the pinnacle of sales and revenue can be generated. Agencies and uh, marketers take our data and they uh, infuse it into their uh, marketing or media models uh, to upweight or downweight impressions based on the relevancy or value of each impression and its ability to extract revenue uh, for them. Oh, good. So here's an example. People who are highly attached to advertising in health clubs are over two times as likely to buy Glade. Uh, they are uh, five-hour energy nuts. They're two times as likely to buy five-power energy. And they like to drink. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of, uh, there's 330 brands, but you know, uh, what I'm trying to get at is there's a lot of endemic and non-endemic categories that you can go after. Uh, importantly, health clubs are saturated with more high-value Glade buyers than many alternative media options. We can compare 
media options across many different uh, platforms. And the reason is, is because we're only measuring one thing, the saturation of high value buyers in each media property, then you can append your reach in any other uh, data. So health clubs are more attaching than everyday health or InStyle, Self, iVillage, lots of different uh, alternatives. So the last example I want to show you, and this should take me a minute, so I should be okay, um, is uh, talking about platforms. Um, the industry tends to define platforms in a very sort of pedantic way. So if you're, when we talk about mobile, uh, we're talking about uh, it has to be a mobile phone. But mobile could be a much broader uh, perspective. Uh, and um, from the consumer perspective, what we looked at is people, uh, men, who are highly attached to Burger King, and we looked at their attachment to receiving information through uh, digitally placed based media versus mobile media, such as a phone or text message. And what you see is they're virtually equivalent. So what, what this is saying to me is, you know, one, that digital place based media is just as effective as mobile media. But more importantly, it really gets to redefining what mobile is. I mean, mobile is not necessarily a platform. People on the move receive their information in many different forms and varieties, and, uh, and uh, digitally placed base is probably really a mobile media in many respects, and much more than that. So just to conclude, you know, digitally placed based environments are a powerful way to reach a variety of brand buyers across a number of categories. Uh, these uh, digitally placed based media outperforms many alternative media, and that you should, as an industry, get your fair share of other platforms. Thank you. All right. Now you've been very patient. We've gone, we've gone into the weeds. We really learned a lot about this. Let's get some down-to-earth questions. We just happen to have a few prepared right here. Um, OK. Gary, let me ask you this first. I wanted to get some context about you all. What is your job? What do you do within the company? Uh, well, uh, New Media Metrics was founded. Under uh, three minutes. Yeah, I'm a joint founder of, of New Media Metrics. <laughs> Uh, what do I do? You know, we developed the, the approach. We've spent uh, years proving that emotional attachment was predictive of both purchase behavior and media behavior because we truly believe that the two together is where revenue is extracted and that's where the relevance is in the marketplace. So I do uh, every, you know, I do half of what the company does because my business partner, Denise Larson, is the, uh, you know, the research guru and I am more of a marketing media application of emotional attachment in the marketplace. Name two clients. J&J uh, &J is a big client of ours. Universal McCann is a big client of ours. Verizon's a client of ours. Uh, Yahoo, number of different clients. Very good. Two. <laughs> you asked for two, but yes, well, of course two. Well, the, you, I felt emotionally attached to the four answers <laughs> instead. Jeff, tell, what, do you, what do you do? Sure, co-founder uh, co of Shopper Sciences. Um, and uh, you can say we study shoppers. That really isn't me. That would be a mistake of really amazing proportions. Um, my partner, John Ross, again, is the intellectual center of the company because it, we're really solving a problem that he had as a retailer. Um, my job is to help spread that word because I come from the other side of the table yep. as a supplier. So that's what we try to do. Name two clients. Oh, gosh, uh, Google, Coke, Nestle, uh, Brown Foreman. I thought he had five. That's good. Very good. Two is four, right? Two Mike, four. what do you do with MBI? Um, I co-conceived the company uh, back in 2008 when I was still at Ball State University and came on board earlier this year full time. Um, my role is partly to do with um, inputting to the development of the product and strategic direction of the company, but it's also a lot of uh, outreach work, this mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, and spending time with um, end users and potential end users to see where we need to take the product going forward. Name four clients. Um, <laughs> we're very new. We don't have four clients we can Thank talk about goodness. publicly. We have ESPN, who's gone public. Uh, one other that we're meant to be going public with very soon. That's good. I knew if I went to four, we'd go lower on that. Very That's good. good. A question for you, Gary. Um, you know, briefly, how is emotional attachment different than the, real, the numbers most of the folks are using, traditional engagement? Do a few sentences. How is it different? Well, you describe, the, you describe the process. Well, uh, emotional attachment 
is a precursor to engagement. Okay. In other words, you cannot be engaged in a media property or in a brand if you are not emotionally attached to it. It is what causes the engagement. Mm -hmm. The other issue with traditional engagement metrics is they frequently, most importantly, forget to talk about the who. So I can be engaged in a wonderful McDonald's commercial and I can remember everything about it and recall it and like it and love it and everything else, but I'm not going to McDonald's. <laughs> so what's really important is you need to first talk about the who, what people are emotionally attached to, find them in media properties that they are emotionally attached to before you invest the money and then they will be engaged. Okay. Mike, I want to talk to you about, uh, thank you, about uh, USA touch points, because touch points already exist in Europe. In the UK. In the UK, okay. Um, how, is, how is, conceptually, you, you showed it, you showed what the process is, but how are the folks here gonna use it? What can you do to demonstrate for the, for the networks themselves that they have value? What could they do with the data? Sure, I mean, I think, I mentioned it right up front, it's all about context. Um, and we talked a lot about emotion on this panel, which I didn't know about. It's quite interesting that we've all got a, an emotional uh, component to, to what we're capturing and what, what can be leveraged. But the whole thing, whether you start from emotions, whether you start from media use, whether you start from demographics, if we're going to get down to really blunt instruments, um, they all have to be looked at in context. And the, and the one thing that Touchpoints is, is very, very good at is providing um, an accessible su suite, I'd say, of data, which... Um, enables you to illustrate context from a number of different angles. From a media planner's point of view, it's ideal, as I said, you can, you can search against the variables that are important to the campaign and to the client at the time. To uh, a media owner of any kind, um, but I think particularly place-based, because there are so many contextual elements you can bring, in to, bring to bear. Um, you're able to say, okay, I'm having a conversation with, with a major uh, financial services brand or something like that. Then to, to the point that was made earlier in the day about understand the brand and then come to me with solutions. You, you, if you do your homework, then you can say, look, these are the contextual components that we bring to bear, as well as the region, as well as the nature of our audience, um, that lead towards a solution which is going to satisfy your client or which is going to satisfy you, Mr. Client, if you happen to be talking to the client themselves. Whether that's um, you know, ab about the context that consumers themselves bring to the environment, because I think that's the important thing. Context is not only that which is shaped and created by the, the physical environment and, and the content that they'll encounter through your media, it's also shaped by the reasons they're there, by the, the mindset they're in when they come there, um, what they've been doing beforehand, because that's a communications channel in itself. Um, and, if, and if you can reach, it, reach out to them through that before they get to your environment, so much the better. Um, so there's, there's all these different aspects to the contextual which make it like a matrix. Uh, and we've, we've structured this and we'll continue to structure it um, in a more and more robust way as we go forward, that it applies in, in more dimensions for more um, uh, place-based environments. Could they forward. use it today? Yes, yes, absolutely, it's available. Okay. We've got a, a data set which came out of a, a, a million dollar plus pilot which was underwritten by the Coalition for Innovative Media Measurement made up of advertisers, agencies and media owners. Um, that data set is now available. Um, there'll be, that will be doubled in size in January and becomes available and, and it's accessible through the likes of IMS and Telmar okay. and, and Point Logic. Gary, could they use your system? Could, could folks out here who are responsible for selling advertising use the product a today? Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, used by many agencies and clients alike, either in a syndicated fashion, which I showed you some of the data right. from, but there's 330 brands. Uh, and we work uh, with uh, a lot of uh, brands on a customized basis. And in that scenario, what we're doing is helping them understand who's attached to the brand, why they're attached. And we'll look at that entire 11 point spectrum and we'll find people who are six to the brand, seven to the brand, eight to the brand, et cetera. We'll quantify them, we'll understand why they're attached to the brand, how to increase that emotional attachment because every point of emotional attachment equals significant increased revenue. And then we identify where they can uh, find their, where those people who are attached to the brand or moderately attached intently view across all cross-platform media properties down to the programming level. The answer was yes. Okay, all these, too many softballs, Jeff. Let me try <laughs> another one on you. 
Um, so smartphone penetration. Right. It's um, half the country and growing. Mm -hmm. So how can digital place-based advertisers or providers or retailers keep up with the media, considering these influences going on while they're in the store, yeah. uh, from the phone, from yeah. all types of places, from from everywhere, from yeah, exactly. now more or even this. Yeah, I I love the the uh, the keynote that, that preceded us where that concept of shoppers as broadcasters is that's not a phenomenon that we should be amazed at. We should honor it. Um, what a fabulous opportunity. You know, it, it makes our life harder. It makes a hell of a lot harder if you're an agency or a, you know, a, a, the CMO. But God, to have the ability to have a conversation with a brand, we've talked about it for a generation, and now it's available. So the onus is on us to, to hunker down and, and get the work done. To do it, obviously, requires something that we don't do well, which is diagnostics. Um, everybody does forensics. And forensics is great unless you're the guy on the slab, and then it sucks. Um, but, and that's what we do. With the data that we, that we primarily have, these three companies notwithstanding, we tend to, and I can say this as an old retail guy, we, we're looking at what happened yesterday or even last hour, and it doesn't necessarily tell me what's going to happen next hour because the influencer will change. So all of these have to be, I think, utilized and more uh, in terms of making forward-looking diagnostics to your business. Um, if I can give you an analogy on that, too, we have a, a customer you talk about one that we wouldn't expect, Joe Gibbs Racing. Okay, it's a big racing owner operator out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, their mission statement is, we make cars go faster. And they literally hired us and said, help us do that better. And uh, you know, we have nothing to do with cars. We, you know, that, and obviously they get their, their, some of their revenue through advertising. And they said, don't, don't worry about the advertising. We figure that's gonna come. We make cars go faster, help us do that. And they're, they're, where they were headed with this was brilliant. And that was they know the NASCAR shopper. They intuitively know it. They wanted to quantitatively know it so that they could predict where they needed to go to make cars faster. So. You're right in what you say about um, you know, the secondary screen and Twitter and all the rest of it. I mean, and I, the movie industry is a case in point. Right. Um, if the Twitterverse says when a movie opens at the end of that movie or even halfway through the movie, Iron Man 3 sucks. Yeah. They pull their buttons. It doesn't, they by are, the way. Well, <laughs> if they were to say that, yeah. then that radically alters their spend for the rest of that weekend and they just pull it for the rest of the week because they, they, you can predict mm -hmm. what's going to happen to box office sales on the basis of what Twitter says now. Exactly. And I, th I think there's a real opportunity with second screens that TV is starting to explore, um, which is automatic content recognition, mm -hmm. the, the embedded codes with, with audio codes and so forth. I think that plays out in this space as well. Not in all environments, but in some. So that, yeah, if I've downloaded an app which is relevant to that space or the, you know, the brand owner of the space and so forth, um, then stuff can come up on my screen when, when it knows that I'm there and it recognizes the signal, whether it's a tablet or whether it's a smartphone. And that's an area which hasn't been tapped massively yet. And again, it can be a way of extending the relationship with the venue and the content and the advertiser outside of the environment. Let's extend the relationship with the audience for a moment. They're here. I gave them the easy questions. Anyone want to ask anything? There's a, so many hands raised. I can't. Oh, you used to work with me. Hey, we do better than Guilty. Guilty. Got a question. Um, a okay, we got a question. So, I totally see the value from. Where are you from? I'm from. My name is Dan Rosenfeld. I'm the director of research with Zoom Media. Thank you. Um, I, I absolutely see a sales value uh, in terms of all your offerings. You know, uh, from a sales perspective. Um, however, since we, you know fairly new media here, we have a challenge of selling our vanilla audience measurement mm -hmm. in meetings. Right. To throw in the additional selling of your research methodology, I can see being a challenge in terms of yeah. time sure. and maybe a little bit uh, stressful on the mind. Yeah. Could, um, it be help could it be helpful, do you think? Oh, I, I, abs I absolutely think there's a, a ton of value just in terms of, you know, you know, context matters. Yeah. Uh, it, it totally works for place-based video, and there's a, there's a, the offerings here quantify that. So I, I absolutely see the value. Just thoughts on that particular challenge in yeah. terms of selling not one yeah. but two research methodologies. Right you know, in meetings. I make it three, make it five. Right. You know, I mean, and I say that not self-servingly because I really could care less to be in the research business. What I care about is that shopper. And believe me, I was that sales guy, you know, talking to an advertiser, talking to a retailer, you know, trying to convince someone to spend $50 million to put in a place-based media network. 
that requires a level of challenge to the person that you're selling to that the greatest salespeople exhibit. Um, there's some new research actually from the Executive Conference Board. I highly recommend you read it. They they've did some research that classified salespeople into the, the people who are the most productive versus those who are not. And the traditional stereotypes you have are reversed. Um, a, what they call a challenger salesperson, the one who uses research not just to try to sell but to force their prospective target beyond their comfort zone into confusion, into almost a, a matter of, of, oh my God, now what do I do? Because all of a sudden your solution clarifies right in the middle of that problem, you know, whatever that is. And I'm not saying there's any single type of research that does that, it's probably all of it. But it, it, is, it does create harder work, it does make it harder for your sales guys, no doubt about it, but it is absolutely what your customer needs. I, I want to ask him, I, I, I would add ahead. to that in that I think that, you know, it, the client is always looking for what's relevant to them, not just impressions, not just another number. They're looking for people who actually buy their products. And to the point that you can prove that your media delivers an intently viewing audience that actually is going to be receptive to the message, that just helps propel and perpetuate the importance. Uh, I, I, want I, to try, I want to try one more question. Is there anyone here who would like to volunteer who actually would be, shall we say, a uh, buyer here? Any comments from uh, people who are in the buying area? I don't want to call out names, Chris. Anyone want to say anything about the reality? Anything about the reality? What is the reality of what we're just hearing in conversation? Oh, he's anything you can. Volunteer with a microphone. <laughs> oh, man. look, we have, a, we have someone yeah. from the audience. Have a seat. You might just say no, you realize. Yeah, he said no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I am so unemotionally attached to you guys, it's ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> we so failed. Um, what is the reality? I, my reality is that when uh, I'm trying to, you know, explain to clients what this medium does and how, why I think it has value, um, the more relevant I can be to each of those clients' businesses, uh, the better. Um, I think what I often, f you know, what a lot of us fight is inertia, mm -hmm. and we need something to break up the, we need something to break that up. We need something that actually has to have meaning. So I, I would, I, I guess I would support um, a deeper understanding of, of why and how yeah. uh, different place-based networks would yeah deliver on, an, on a certain client's mm. objectives mm. And, and help drive more ROI. Stopping. I mean, there's no question that we're all looking for data that, that um, illustrates how you can drive more ROI, but the, the truth is, like, if I go to my clients and say, okay, well, I spend, you know, $80 million in TV for you, and I can sort of measure that, but I have this other network I want you to spend 30 grand on, and it's going to drive a lot of ROI, that doesn't mean shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a so nice, yes. It, it, but that, I like it. I think it's important to support the medium overall because that is a larger, scalable conversation. And uh, so I do, I do believe that, that this kind of stuff is going to be very important moving forward. I hate to be rude to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for seeing all your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.